technically complex, it's engaging, it's beautiful. And the way that she uses collage within her abstract work um, starts to bring to mind uh, natural landscapes and our place in it. Uh, many of her pieces uh, incorporate elements that turn and fold and lift off the page. And so in that way, her pieces become, start to occupy the space between a two-dimensional print and an artist's book and become more of an experience for people. Um, Kelda participates in the Open Source Artist Residency and Motherhood that's organized by the social practice artist Linka Clayton. And it's a key way for her to enter making work um, in limited amounts of time. That happens when you're <laughs> employed full time and uh, have two children. <laughs> so Kelda is represented by J. Reinhardt Gallery in Pioneer Square here in Seattle. And you can find uh, her online at keldamartinson.com and also uh, on Instagram at kelda underscore jean. And if you have questions during the presentation, we'd love for you to uh, use the group chat to type out your questions. Kelda is, has a kind of structure for her talk, but your questions are going to help us um, inform where the talk goes. And so you are an important part of today's event. Um, so thank you for again for being here. And I am very happy to present the 2019 Larry Summers Fellowship recipient, Kelda Martinson. On to you, Kelda. <laughs> Claire, you are the best. You're so generous. Thank you so much for doing this and putting so much time and energy into um, just organizing it and promoting it and for all the work you do on the Seattle Print Arts Board. I know it's a lot and for our community um, and thank you to Suki who set this up as well and um, thank you all for being here. I, before you turned your videos off, I was just loving looking at all your faces and being um, joyfully distracted by them. But <laughs> um, so I will attempt to do multiple things at once, which is to um, go through the slideshow and also talk and monitor the chats. And as Claire said, I would really love for your questions to really um, direct where this conversation goes. I'm much more comfortable in a conversation format rather than a lecture format, as my students know. So um, I will begin. And Claire, um, there we go. Yep. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'll share the screen. So to step back away from our current time, um, I wanted to start with some older work, um, work from about 10 to 12 years ago, and talk a little bit about where, um, sort of how I got to this place in terms of uh, the work that I make. So. This was in grad school and at the time I had just moved from Anchorage, Alaska and moved to St. Louis and was really just grappling with sort of jarring um, combinations of, uh, you know, of like how landscapes fit together in my mind. And I um, was really thinking about my life, I was moving every couple of years and, and using art as a way to uh, reconcile that and to sort of grapple with, with place. And, um, I was also taking advantage of the facilities and just the access and trying to soak in and process just the floodgates of inspiration I was getting at that time from faculty and peers and, and just all the artists I was suddenly aware of. Um, so this work uh, was quite large and layered. Um, I was printing on pretty massive sheets of plexiglass and, and wood block and calligraph. Um, this piece goes 12 feet across um, and trying to um, work sort of beyond the scale of my body like plates that I could hardly handle manipulating physically because they were so large or that I needed even you know more than one person to help print. This is also when I started thinking about paper coming off of the plane and getting um, using prints and the two dimensional print, um, but pushing that into low relief and using the space around the print and starting to think also about where that intersection of page and and print is and like what the 
that where um, my art could live between artist books and prints. I was using a lot of photography taken by myself or my partner um, and incorporating that using digital prints or solvent transfers. And then also thinking a lot about um, my upbringing and my dad being a woodworker working in the shop. Um, this was really just where I grew up and thinking about architecture as a way of talking about my personal story. The time I was looking at other artists who really used this sort of graphic storytelling um, and who also spoke a lot about land and architecture um, and the human relationship to that. So this is uh, Carlos Vega, uh, William Kentridge, Shazia Sikander, Enrique Chagoya, and Kim Beck, who really continue to be uh, very influential to me still. I just uh, love how sort of epic their work is, but also very nuanced. You have to look quite closely, but um, it's also really uh, stunning and arresting from a distance. But as I left grad school, um, the work that really stayed with me, the work that haunted me the most was uh, way more stripped down and really became a lot more concerned with elements of design sometimes just a mark or a punctuation, uh, one single form on a page. This piece by Moholy Naj is a favorite of mine. And then I show this photograph. It's one that I snapped um, without permission while in the artist studio of Franz Ackermann. And it was just pinned up on his wall very casually, but I've never stopped thinking about it. And I think that this, um, making collage really ostensible in this way and the way that it becomes surreal and it's overlapping. Also its use of just Xerox is something that I uh, fell in love with and tried to aspire to in my work. When I moved back to Seattle, um, I lost a lot of access to facilities and space, of course, and also time. And my work uh, instantly shrank and I started to become more concerned with um, sort of an aesthetic efficiency, telling a story in a minimal amount of moves and materials. But still calling on photographs um, from my past and also pushing the two-dimensional plane. So in this piece, even though it's quite tiny, only eight by eight inches, um, I you know, hand laid every piece of veneer as if I was laying a hardwood floor. In 2012, I um, became pregnant with my first daughter immediately after getting my first full-time academic teaching job. <laughs> and um, my work became, um, I, looking back at it now, it, it, there's a lot of loneliness in it. Um, this body of work was very uh, hard to make. It was autobiographical and, um, and sort of monumental for me. I remember my sister, no one knew I was pregnant. My sister saw this piece and she called me like, are you doing okay? <laughs> so, um, I, I think this is the turning point when my work became um, about my life in a more authentic way and less about just places I had been or experienced, but really an internal landscape. Um, but ultimately, um, this work relied on my photographic inventory. I only used images that were taken from um, my grandpa's old nigromat, which I have here somewhere, um, and film photography but as the expense of film photography grew and my access to printers you know um i didn't have that anymore then i really turned to what i first fell in love with um in printmaking which is texture and the textures of plates so now um 2016 i was pregnant with my second daughter and it was a long uncomfortable time for me and i remember making this piece and it i think was one of the first pieces that 
became part of the series I eventually called um, Tiny Temporary Collages, which was a way of organizing my work only digitally and through social media, through um, using that as a hashtag. Um, but this piece, all I can do, really I felt that was all I could do was go through my flat files, find works from a time when I had more energy and more bandwidth and try to find some existing story there. Um, but as I played with the texture, for me, they um, started to tell an even more personal story and maybe even a more universal one. So um, I used this, which was very small, you know, uh, just like nine inches across, as a way of catapulting the larger, more finished works. So I would take uh, the composition from that and blow it up and uh, make wood blocks based off of that composition. And so that um, coming to terms with that space I was in sort of propelled and, and fueled the larger wood box. I wrote some notes here, so I might look down and see if I'm forgetting huge parts of what I plan to talk about. <laughs> So trusting these collages to inform this larger work and playing with these wood blocks in a way, um, this felt very calming to me. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a wood shop and uh, working with wood is really natural for me. I've been drawing on and making things with wood my whole life and um, I think my dad is listening. But, um, you know, wood was in more abundance than paper in my house growing up. We had, you know, notes were taken on end cuts um, of wood, little scraps of plywood. And so that feeling of, of playing with shapes and just letting the wood texture speak for itself really felt to do um, what I needed it to do for me without even much carving, but just playing with the texture and playing with the wood grain. This is what my studio table looks like before anything is um, put together. So I just have piles and piles of prints, oftentimes on um, thinner papers, washi papers, also on more cotton rag papers. But I um, just print up wood blocks over and over and over again. And the shapes that happen when they sort of collide on the table sometimes end up being where they end up formally. And other times um, they, there's several iterations to follow. In, um, um, oh, let me back up. So these pieces I do actually wrestle with quite a bit. There's, um, you know, they take a lot of setup time, um, power tools, wood, material, a lot of time in inking, cleaning up. And uh, when my second daughter was born in 2017, I really felt like I had no time left in the studio between teaching full-time and raising the kids. Um, but I was making work. I was drawing and um, I decided then to start to join the artist residency in motherhood, which Claire mentioned earlier as a um, project started by social practice artist, Linka Clayton. And it's a self-directed, self-imposed residency. And the idea is not um, dissimilar to what you see now during quarantine and the self-isolation residency starting, but really sort of claiming your own space and the situation you're in as a time for making whatever that might look like for you. And this um, structure, this like simple act of declaring that has really been uh, really useful for me. It was a way for me to bring everything I was doing in the studio sort of together under one conceptual umbrella and to um, think of these these acts these small acts whether they never made it into a print um, maybe it was just one moment of overlap but maybe it that in itself was interesting so thinking about um, restrictions instead of a loss um, as useful parameters
during this time, um, I was listening to podcasts as I often do. And one podcast that I have had on repeat over and over and over is the New Yorker fiction podcast. And there's a, a certain episode where Mosan Hamid is talking with Deborah Treisman, the fiction editor, and they're talking about the work of Borges, which I adore. They're talking about his piece, The Book of Sand, and just this idea of this Borgesian idea of compression and how he can speak about like the whole universe um, in a short, a short work of prose. And I started thinking about that um, idea of compression and like how I'm trying to speak about loss or about land in a simple, maybe one action collage. Um, he talks about something that I, that I always think about, which is how um, maybe we don't need to give ideas as much space as we're giving them. And how can you, you know, tell the story you're trying to tell and then let it be. So in other words, one action is potentially enough to carry an idea forward and we don't necessarily need to give ideas more time and space than they require and this has been a really really useful to me in my working just in thinking about um moving on like doing a collage and then letting it be and then moving on to the next thing rather than trying to overwork and find the bandwidth to find resolution in my work because i just don't usually have it um, i can count my studio time in a matter of minutes now instead of hours and so things do sort of need to happen relatively quickly um, but yet i still hope that they carry with them a meaning that goes much longer So I'll just walk through a little bit um, of pieces that have come from that act in the, in the studio of just playing with material, overlapping collage. And here's another example of taking a composition that happened um, in a small space in a collage of overlapping materials and how it grew to become um, the template for a much larger woodcut. I wrote this quote listening to Anne Hamilton speak when she was in Seattle last and I it just uh, really struck me how much making artwork really is just about the people that are helping you do it. It feels uh, so humbling to think of it in this way. Um, I don't know, you know, always where it's going. There are just truly hunches um, that we take to the studio with us, that we try to figure out what they are, what they mean. But in the meantime, none of it is possible without each other. I wanted to end um, the slideshow, but I hope that we can continue the conversation with just a couple of um, artist books that I've made in honor of my students, who I know a couple of whom are listening, but they are working hard to make books in this time remotely and um, are dedicated to their learning. And I'm just really inspired by everyone who's trying to still connect in such meaningful ways um, during this time. So I couldn't see any of the chats that came up, but I do hope that there um, are questions and I would love to go back and talk about some of these pieces further and I will stop the screen share now. Thank you, everyone. Awesome, thank you, Kelda, that was great. I have tons of questions. <laughs> okay, yay, oh, everyone's so kind. <laughs> and um, we have uh, one from, uh, Maxfield, Shay, and they write, wondering if you're responding to the texture in a new or different way in this interior time of COVID. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm reading these now. Yeah, so the time of COVID for me, um, I'm really so fortunate to still be working and um, to have my health. Also, I have been in quarantine with um, two young children in my family and trying to homeschool um, and be a daycare and also teach. So um, 
COVID for me has just been uh, a process in trying to stay positive. And um, the work that I'm making is really, everything I'm making now and responding to is sort of has to be for teaching, right? So anytime I'm in the studio, I feel like it's gotta be recorded or it has to have some other use. It has to be for the purpose of demonstration just because time is of the essence. And so I've really felt connected to my students this quarter in a way that is different because um, they are the ones sort of propelling me forward. And, um, and then just the childcare is really tricky. I mean, we, my kids used to be out of the house maybe eight to 10 hours each day between um, school and after school care, which are really long days. And that is one nice thing um, is that they are home more, but without that space, um, I'm finding uh, that I can't really make anything in the way that I'm used to. So I do feel sort of thrown back into that stage of having a newborn or being pregnant or having these restrictions. And I'm not quite there yet, to be totally honest, in terms of spinning this to be a positive um, self-isolation residency. I know it's an interesting time and I know I'll have perspective on it at some point, but I don't quite have that yet. Um, one thing that I, in terms of your question and texture, I'm really um, just drawing so much more and loving the line quality. I think it's because I am um, making art with my kids more. We're doing science lessons. We're doing observational drawing. And so um, the texture of all of this is more what I'm finding outside, um, the textures in nature, because that has proven to be um, one thing that offers the most solace. Cool. Yeah, I think I think what is interesting about your earlier work um, when you started to feel, you know, that time crunch and then maybe what many of us are feeling now with COVID is sort of that same, <laughs> how do we make with what we have um, and not, um, and feel maybe that loss of all the things or all the access that we have to different spaces or materials, but using what we have and that being enough for right now and that's okay mm -hmm. um and that kind of uh yeah being able to mourn and also accept um what's happening in the moment and maybe going back and forth between those all the time <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think I forgot to mention this earlier in talking about the artist residency and motherhood, but one thing um, that I didn't start feeling momentum in my work um, really until I came to terms with it is that maybe the work we make when we're not making the work we want to be making is enough. And maybe that um, precisely because it has that tension that's what makes it interesting and that's what makes it worth investigating a little bit more um, because it's so heavily held back in these interesting ways that um, that you wouldn't necessarily have before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, don't get me wrong if you want to give me like time and a sabbatical at like a studio with high ceilings <laughs> and big walls, like I would take it in a second. But I think it's been um, healthy for me to just realize that I don't want to miss this time in my making. Um, I know it's interesting time. I don't have perspective on it yet, but I want to try to capture it the only way that I can. And, and that's kind of gets back to that Anne Hamilton quote, which is just, they're only hunches. You know, there really is no distance to any of the work yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's a great question from Nikki. Um, she writes, at what point did you realize that you didn't need to give um, an idea more than one action to feel okay about it? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, uh, listening to that podcast was an aha moment for me, like con connecting it to literature, which has always helped me think about my work. Um, you know, if my work can be spoken about in um, literary terms, that's the highest compliment for me. I just feel like there's so much um, there that makes a lot of sense. And so hearing about Borges and, and 
realizing that, you know, this doesn't, this idea doesn't need more time and space than, uh, than you have to give to it. It's okay to talk about the universe in, you know, 600 words. Um, it's okay to talk about our relationship with land with just an edge between two different materials or two different fields of color. And um, in terms of what point that has been for me, I think it's been a, a spectrum, you know, that I sometimes I fall off of, but uh, I think it's been maybe in the last year or two, really, since since my second daughter was born and I was really forced to figure out how I was going to make this work. Um, you know, after my first daughter, I still had the illusion of time. She was a great <laughs> keeper. Um, you know, there I have a wonderful supportive partner who does a lion's share of um, childcare a lot of the time and is watching them now upstairs. Um, but with two, it just, it was just, uh, you know, it flattened me. So I, I think her life in the last two years, she's two now, two and a half, um, has made me just had to figure out things quick. And I love her for it. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, and then uh, following Nikki's question, how does the book format interact with one small idea versus within a print? Um, is there something special about how a book lets you keep your ideas slash compositions, small, subtle, minimal, etc., on a given page, for example, and still play out a variation or complexity over the course of an entire book? Yeah, I mean, I think there is something so special about the book. And I love um, pushing prints to, you know, two-dimensional print that maybe has a hint of being a book or something that lifts off. And then on the opposite end of that or the other side of the hand, um, a book that's only allowed, you're only allowed to see one page. So maybe it's only open to, to one spread and then it's framed that way. Or it's... Um, you know, this idea of a book where the recto and the verse, like the front of a page is only the front for so long before it becomes the back. And there's just all so many metaphors and um, potential in a book. I think you can just hand someone a blank book and there's already a huge story there. So the book does a lot of the work and the conceptual heavy lifting for me just to sort of give a nod to that format which is what I find so interesting. So, um, you know, I think to Claire's question, um, yeah, it lets me, I love how she worded it. Keep your ideas, composition, small, subtle, and minimal, um, because there's always the potential that there's more pages to the story. You're only getting a glimpse and that's okay because you don't want the whole story to be told to you immediately. You know it's there for you in the future whether it is or not, you know, whether you can actually access that story at the time. Yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. interesting. I think your practice of only having maybe just one spread and framing that or having that be what people can see is very interesting um, mm -hmm. in that it's very different than what I, who has limited uh, experience with artist books, would imagine. Um, like just having that and then not, and then blocking off access to the rest of it, even if it, there's nothing in it. Um, exactly. Yeah. It could be maddening. I mean, I know my, you know, when I'm teaching book arts and like, it's always such a conundrum of how to display them or how to photograph them or document them. But there's something in that madness that I really love and appreciate. Um, just a bit of the mystery and keeping something back. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, can you talk a little bit about um, your prints that have the pieces that, you know, become a little bit three-dimensional and like how is that different for you than the books are they meant to be interacted with or is it more like kind of a tantalizing aspect 
Um, I don't know that they are meant to be interacted with. I certainly like documenting them as an interaction. So like having my hand in the documentation or like lifting a flap, but um, it's not necessary that they're handled in that way. I think again, it just sort of nods to the book or to the story or that there's some sort of um, narrative to come or, or narrative that's already been there. That um, And then I also just love the play of Shadow. Um, I had a studio visit once with a woman that, um, you know, my print had some really hard, like, wrinkles and and the collage was a bit rough um and then there was a place when i was really trying to make the collage a lot more seamless and smooth and and she um encouraged me to just let that be ostensible like if i'm going to talk about edges like it's okay that the edge is there and i took that um to heart and i felt that i could um Sort of expand that into more three-dimensionality so yeah the edge is there um, potentially the paper is rough it's not pristine I'm not as a, a very neat printmaker um, there's a lot of my process that you know prints get totally wrinkled as they go through the press or the wood cuts through the, <laughs> the paper which is total no-no uh, in printmaking but I love those accidents because it then I have to really get in there and deal with that fold or deal with that rip um, and that sort of propels me in into maybe braver territory than I would have gone in um, so allowing for those whether they're uh, from happy accidents or whether they're um, I showed that image of my table when I'm collaging and, and how um, the prints sometimes just fall when I'm cleaning up or how they pile on one another um, encourages me to sort of leave that element of, of layered in a more ostensible way and not like fully adhere everything down. Cool. Yeah. I, mean, I love, I love the uh, informality and also the, uh, the allowing of these technical mistakes to then import form the process. I guess for me, like it's interesting because the you are creating these narratives. Um, I guess I'm wondering like how much of um, when you're making the piece, the narrative is there as you're constructing it versus you kind of see it later when you're pulling back. Yeah, that's like the question with the capital Q is, um, you know, just like, for me, because all of my textures are from my previous works or something I'd done minutes before or months before or years before, um, I made the plate for them. It's all a very hands-on tactile story. So I feel like it's imbued with my personal narrative, um, even if it's a tiny scrap of paper. Um, and I don't know that I ever fully describe the story in my own mind. Um, and I always sort of put my work out into the world, hoping that that's okay. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> and hoping that people see something in it. Um, and when they do, I'm just so honored. It's just the greatest compliment. Um, because I don't always know. Um, all I'm trying to do is be authentic and like let a... Uh, you know, a piece of my creative process out there and do it in a way that it's intriguing enough for people to want to stick with it. Um, and so I guess to answer your question, it's neither always there in the making or after the fact um, in any sort of fully articulated way. I do sometimes though, in terms of titles, realize what it's saying. And I try to encapsulate that or at least give a, um, a more specific window into my narrative uh, with the title. Yes, I think you do a great job with your titles um, of allowing a viewer that maybe isn't um, so interested in maybe an abstract work to mm. begin to see that narrative. I, I really respond to that. Um, and appreciate that rather than it being untitled. Um, yeah. Even if it's not necessarily, you know, something that um, really was what you were thinking about, <laughs> that it came later or, you know, something that you wanted to 
play upon. So uh, let's see what else we have in the chat. Um, so Nico says, I love the permission to let go of the big work, especially in this time. We need time for the perspective um, to get to how we can process it all. It all. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, there's a question that says, Kelda, could you talk more about how artist books fit into your practice? Yeah, they've um, always been a part of my practice. And I, um, you know, in my, I found artist books going through, my parents recently moved and I went back through some old work and I had found books that I had made um, in elementary school and middle school that I had no idea I was interested in that at the time. So that was kind of cool to, to um, stumble on those again. And to me, it's this way of, you know, I, grew up being really comfortable with construction and, and uh, the three-dimensional realm, but I always really am more drawn to works on paper and being a paper-based artist. So books for me have bridged that, those interests um, in a way that I never get tired of. I am uh, drawn to machinery and equipment, which I think all printmakers are, um, have a love of that. And in bookmaking and letterpress, I mean, I just absolutely fell head over heels for it when I had access to it in graduate school. And then I went a long time without access to letterpress and um, started to really just appreciate books in a more simplistic way in terms of um, just accordion folds and, um, you know, our very simple pamphlet stitches. I'm not one who um, works in complicated or, uh, or very sophisticated bindings. I really love um, just what one fold or one signature can mean to a story and this idea of sides and narrative and sequence. Um, so I, I love the ability to go back and forth. I, um, right now I'm teaching book arts online to my amazing students. And um, so right now I'm really surrounded by it. That's all I'm doing in the studio and that's what I'm looking at all the time and, and recording myself doing. So um, it's also gives me a long time to just work with my hands and I think that just um, kinetic the process and a bit more um, just the folding and the being able to sort of zone out and, and just make is something that collage doesn't really afford me and that printmaking doesn't always afford me either because I don't set out on large um, carvings anymore. Um, gotcha. Looks like a couple people are asking about the connection between the collages and the woodcuts. And um, that I think is, they inform, um, they inform one another, they often become part of one another. So when I make a, a woodcut, I'm really shaping a wood plate is a more accurate way of talking about it. I'm not um, carving into it as much as I used to. And I'm um, using what's called a cut all and um, making big shapes out of one piece of plywood and then inking that up. And then I'll draw into it sometimes with a um, etching needle or a scribe to bring out some of the wood grain and the texture, even like a steel, wool, a steel brush. And, um, and then using the ink and the way that the ink falls on the grain to, to bring out the imagery and the texture in the wood block. But the wood block rarely ever is its own thing left alone for me. It, it always becomes part of the collage and I'm making it in order to collage it later. Um, and then vice versa, the collages will use, they'll use the woodcuts. And then when I'm doing the larger compositional woodcuts, I'll um, put bits and pieces of collage in there. So they feed each other constantly and I don't see them as that separate from uh, one another, although they're certainly separate in scale. And um, it was actually the Larry Summers Fellowship application that was one of the first times I started to see that body of work together, um, both the small temporary collages that became finalized, and then also these larger woodcut compositions, and seeing them all in a grouping and being able to articulate sort of those undertones that run throughout and the shared material qualities between them. Um, because one thing that I've 
been unable to do in this period of time is like think about the idea of like brand new huge bodies of work. Um, I just don't have the time or um, the ability to have a sustained level of focus or attention in the studio, um, nor the bandwidth to do that. And so seeing that connection and making it stronger through the artist residency and motherhood has helped me feel like I have momentum in my career and in, and in my studio practice. I hope that answers those questions. Um, Claire, I think I lost track of. Sure, yeah. Um, I think maybe uh, something that, a question that relates to what you were just speaking to is from Juen. And can you talk more about your project for Larry Summers and share some of the works from this fellowship? Yeah, so um, with the Larry Summers Fellowship, um, I just felt so honored and and really encouraged in this time because I uh, don't always feel like I'm giving my studio practice what I want to. It it feels just so good to be seen um, and acknowledged and for the work that that is happening and and that maybe it is enough and it, it is okay. Um, though it all feels, you know, hard and a bit of a struggle. Um, so the work that I've made since then has been. Um, mostly in preparation for a solo show at J. Reinhardt Gallery in January, which I hope we will be able to see in person a bit, um, and doing a lot of the prep work. So I'm making wood cuts, um, uh, wood plates, and inking them up and getting a lot of printed material ready. The other thing that's been, um, I've been spending a lot of time on this past year has been curatorial projects. So I was um, co-curating a um, book and print art show with Kamluk Karia, and uh, we were going to bring it to San Juan, Puerto Rico for the Southern Graphics International Conference. Um, that was set to happen in April and did not. So that's been postponed till 2023, but it's still on. And then um, my other big curatorial project this spring um, was co-curating a show of Artist Mothers with Paula Rebsum. And that was going to be at the Soil Art Gallery. And it was actually going to be this month, the month of May. Um, but uh, we didn't feel it was safe to proceed with it. And so that's going to be happening next May. And then um, the other thing I was preparing for was a artist residency in July at Pine Meadow um, Ranch, which I um, am not going to, but it will happen um, next year. So I have been very uh, busy trying to balance all these curatorial and sort of long-term projects and they all sort of stopped or halted. Um, at the same time and so it's been a lot of just kind of catching my breath and trying to keep up with teaching and um you know just support friends and and try to get through this time together i mean this pandemic has been um sort of stopped so much um of our world and and now it's about just trying to pivot and um think about what comes next yeah absolutely and i mean like hearing you speak about all these really great sounding projects, um, I think it it feels really. I mean, do you feel that sad, and you've been mourning that that those are not happening right now, or do you feel like you haven't had the space to? Yeah, no, I'm way too stressed to be sad. <laughs> no, I mean the the trying to teach online has just taken every ounce of my energy. Um, <laughs> so I, but you know, I'm also grieving at the same time. It's all, it's all very, nothing is um, categorized, right? Like it, it's all a very blended bucket of life right now, teaching, homeschooling, living, sure. um, trying to stay safe. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so no, I mean, of course, I, I really want the opportunities and both of those projects 
involved so many great artists and and i know for them that they're also having so many thing other things canceled on them and so i do grieve for the opportunity to to highlight their amazing work um but i know it's going to happen it'll happen in the future so it's um we just have to be patient yeah i like this question to follow that up with what we were talking about from amanda what is bringing you the most joy right now ah uh, um so, you know, I think my friends, my colleagues um, are just everything to me right now. Um, people are so supportive and I've always felt that way um, since moving back to the Seattle area, since getting involved with Seattle Print Arts um, and since teaching with my um, amazing crew at North Seattle. Um, without my friends and without my colleagues and without my family like i don't know where you know where i would be so definitely people are bringing me the most joy um you know my kids are are delightful and um that's been really fun you know getting to sort of know them on a more intimate uh level you know working full time and having them in in full time childcare i didn't there was a lot I didn't see about their lives and I'm seeing that now. And um, so that, that is joyful. Awesome. I'm reading the quick. Thank you so much. I love all these chats. Yes. <laughs> do you want to address the one from Anne Marie? Uh, how do you balance the ephemeral to the visceral? Do you always feel you achieve the endpoint, or do you feel that this will continue in some other manifestation, edition, or series? Mm, what a great question. Um, I think I gave up on the concept of balance a long time ago. <laughs> and it all feels very much an experiment to me now. Um, when I, you know, I love the ephemeral. I love teaching um, zines and, and like just things that are maybe photocopied or that you pick up or that are free. And yet I just love this concrete, more laborious, um, time consuming processes of printmaking. And um, I don't know that any of that has anything to do with balance, but it just has to do with um, what feeds me. And I've, um, you know, as I was showing in the artists that I was looking at, I love these like highly saturated, um, intensely narrative works of, of Enrique Chagoya, for instance, and then also that, um, you know, Laszlo Moholinage or these very like stripped down design pieces. And um, I love, you know, a, a risograph print that's given away for free or for a dollar and I love an oil painting, I love a sculpture, right? So it's just, I don't, I've never really felt that I had to decide. Um, I hope they, the work comes off as having a consistency. Um, but I just try to give myself grace to find the inspiration when I can and where I can. And, and if I can make something that's um, meant to uh, disintegrate, and if I can make something that will last the ages then i consider both successes i really love working speaking of disintegrating i do really love um working on newsprint um and even though it might change color and fall apart it is uh, that alone is really interesting to me and do i feel that um i've achieved an end point or do you feel this will continue in some other manifestation edition or series yeah i think it's going to continue um there are endpoints all along the way, but as I was putting these slides together, I sort of realized some recurring themes that, you know, I thought I maybe was done with. So I don't know. Um, I think our job as artists is to stay open. Yes, um, here's a question from Kate. Uh, a lot of your prints include outdoor spaces and weather and the natural world. Can you talk about how the natural world inspires or is integrated into your work? I think the natural world and, and back to Amanda's question about what brings you joy is always just um, such a steady source of wonder. And I, um, when I look at the work of Pacific Northwest artists, I, so many of us 
talk about wonder or mysticism or use landscape. Um, and this is not unique to this region, of course. But um, for me, I, I grew up just loving it. My parents brought me outside all the time. Um, I grew up in a, a more rural um, neighborhood. And um, it's always offered me um, a steadiness. And as has the animal world, which I know you didn't see in um, many of these works, but I do also just get so much joy from, from that, thinking about the animal world, thinking about the natural world. And um, um, yeah, just trying to communicate something that is maybe unspoken or that I am just sorely inept at describing. Um, sometimes a rock can do that much better. <laughs> You know, or a coyote. Um, there's something that can be said there that's just understood immediately by the viewer. And I am forever indebted to the natural world <laughs> for letting me work with it in that way. I think uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about that uh, Paula has brought up is um, some of your public art and your murals. Mm. And um, I think that that uh, goes back to you talking about the physicality of some of the past work um, of working really large, and then also how this, how um, putting the work in a public space or an outdoor space, even if it's maybe not the natural world in a city space, like how you think about that and um, some of your practice and if you're um, still still doing that or that's you feel like that's on definitely on hold for a little bit <laughs> yeah right now i'm just seeing these murals pop up on boarded up businesses and i want to get out there it's killing me um i just i love painting outdoors i love that scale um just the whole principle behind um public art is one that i stand behind and i can picture myself doing that solely sometimes but the reality of being outside of the house for that many hours um is just not my reality right now so um the last mural i did was at the roosevelt station it was temporary it came down this past year um, but it was up for a few years and it was just a blast um, again it's working a lot of times with wood or material or just larger tools um, i love being on a ladder and um i just love the visibility i love that everyone can be there and see it and it's something that i'll do more of in the future um, i've gotten a lot of joy in making murals from teaching them i started out teaching with the tacoma uh, murals program brought on there and we did some work in Tacoma, and then that uh, led me to creating a class for North Seattle College in mural arts. And we've made three murals with the students there, and and hopefully we'll make another one this spring. So I think when when maybe my kids are older or I have more time um, to to spend those long hours outside of the house, um, I'll be back out there. Cool. And I think um, we just have a couple more minutes. Um, Kelda, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Or, I mean, we can certainly go longer um, if you want. <laughs> we don't have to, but we were thinking it would be about an hour. So we just have like two minutes left. Um, I just really want to thank everyone. It's, um, I feel so supported and just so, so fortunate. Um, for this community and and for all of you and I hope you all stay very healthy um, I would love to talk more if I didn't get I'm having a hard time tracking the questions and, and talking and looking <laughs> at the same time um, but um, I would love to continue these conversations and and get to all of these lovely comments um, yeah I'm, I'm just really floored by everyone's generosity and and I hope you'll um, 
you'll do this again with more artists, Claire. I, I have really been enjoying watching interviews myself and, and being able to be places virtually that I wouldn't normally be able to because of work or home. So in some ways, this has opened up a lot of new doors and conversations for me. And um, yeah, I just feel really fortunate. So thank you. Yes, thank you. So glad to see more of your work and see your face and your studio. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, really appreciate you uh, being a part of this talk and as well as, um, you know, Seattle Print Arts. And so, yeah, have a great day. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and Claire, maybe you can run that slideshow again so people can um, be reminded to apply for the Larry Summers Fellowship. Sure. Yeah. Um, they haven't, you have until the end of the month, everyone. Um, and I can't thank Seattle Print Arts enough. And of course, for Larry Summers for his enduring legacy and um, just this community welcomed me with open arms when I first arrived back in Seattle and um, really helped me get my footing here. So I'm just 